Good morning. My name is Pastor Jesse. Welcome to Marlton Worship Online. Today we're doing something a little bit differently. Uh, we're going to open our worship with a centering moment based on Psalm 119 um, instead of our normal our normal video uh, in the morning. Um, so you can join along in this responsive reading, uh, or you can just sit back and, and um, look at the, the, the pictures and and listen to the music as we are uh, opening our worship today. I'll be right back to, to greet you and, and to start our worship service off. Uh, let's open worship today. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I have sworn an oath and confirmed it to observe your righteous ordinances. I am severely afflicted. Give me life, O Lord, according to your word. Accept my offerings of, of praise, O Lord, and teach me your ordinances. I hold my life in my hand continually, but I do not forget your law. The wicked have laid a snare for me, but I do not stray from your precepts. Your decrees are my heritage forever. They are the joy of my heart. I incline my heart to perform your statutes forever to the end. Good morning. Again, my name is Pastor Jesse. Welcome to Worship Online. We're happy you joined with us today. Today we're looking at Luke chapter 7, the healing of the centurion's servant and the widow's son, uh, as Jesus is teaching and preaching throughout the Judean countryside. We're going to sing, we're going to uh, have a children's message and, and time that we can color. Um, we'll have a couple of announcements and go out in song. Um, our opening hymn is Our God, and as we are singing, if, if any of the children out there uh, want to grab a, a coloring sheet, um, it doesn't matter what you have, we're going to color a little bit um, during the children's uh, message and during the time with young Christians, um, and I'm going to be coloring alongside of you. So um, go get your sheet of paper or, or a coloring book if you have one. Um, if you don't have one, let us know, and, and we'll, we'll make sure that you get something. Uh, but our opening hymn is Our God. I'll be right back.
I love that song. So this is a time for young Christians. Uh, again, if, if you have a coloring sheet, my coloring sheet is The Healing of the Centurion's Servant. I got this online um, and was able to print it out. Um, so I'm going to color while, while we're talking and, and share my story. Um, because I think, I think coloring is, is one of these activities um, and something that I, I don't really enjoy doing, but I think it'll be good for us as we're talking today. So in the story that, that uh, Mr. Bob is going to read in a minute, Jesus is healing around the country. Jesus is going around the countryside. He's teaching. People are coming out to, to go to church with him. And, and people are just very, very happy that, that Jesus is there. So what happens is one of the, um, one of the, the soldiers, one of the, the, the powerful army guys, a man who is just called the centurion, one of the, the Roman soldiers comes up and, and through one of his servants says, Jesus, I want you to heal one of my slaves. Because back then you could still have slaves. Well, so Jesus started going because people said, you know, hey, Jesus, this is a, this is a powerful guy. He's, he's a soldier. You should go help him. You should go listen to him. So Jesus and his friends, they walk out. They find the centurion. And the centurion sends even more servants out to meet Jesus. Because this is a very rich and powerful guy. He doesn't have time to come out. The centurion says to Jesus through, through, his, through, his, um, through his other soldiers, you know, Jesus, you don't you don't have to come in my house. Um, if you just if you were to just heal my servant, you could do it from you could do it from the street. You don't have to lay hands. You don't have to pray. If if one word from you, Jesus, and my servant would be healed. And so Jesus was surprised by the fact that this guy knew that, and so Jesus healed the centurion's slave. Jesus healed the soldier's servant. And then our story continues in the book of Luke, and it says that there was a widow, there was a woman whose husband had died, and all she had left was her son. Now, her son was, was probably, probably my age, maybe a little bit younger. He, he wasn't a little kid. He was, he was a grown-up. And, you know, because his dad had died, this son was probably responsible for his mother, probably did all of the work um, that his mother needed paid for groceries and paid for doctor's visits. And so when this, this boy died, the mother was very sad, but she also knew that, that times, were gonna get a, times were gonna get very tough if she didn't have anyone to help her pay her bills. And so she was crying and, and the funeral procession was going by and Jesus stopped everything. And, and it says that Jesus looked at the, at the mother and said, don't cry. It'll be okay. And then he raised this boy, this man, he raised him from the dead. And everybody around them were so happy. And they said, wow, Jesus is such a good guy. He's such a good prophet. Look at what he is doing here in Israel. Which I think is a pretty cool story. But what I find the most interesting is these people who Jesus helped, the centurion, the, the soldier, um, and the widow. Because back then, soldiers, they weren't, people didn't like the soldiers. The soldiers were mean, they were violent, they would steal from people. The soldiers were not good guys, they were, they were bad guys. And so Jesus helping the soldiers was, was actually kind of surprising because, you know, people, if people don't like you, why would, why would someone heal you? And the, the woman whose son died, she was, she was probably going to become, become homeless. She was going to become so poor that she couldn't eat, that she probably would have lost her house, that, that she probably would have, she probably would have been sad for the rest of her life. And Jesus helped both of these people and, and Luke, the, the author that we're reading from, Luke wanted us to know for sure that Jesus was coming to help these two people. Now, I finished my coloring, and, and I'll admit, I'm not great at coloring. 
Do you see over here? I, I color outside of the lines all the time. I'm, I'm really not that, that careful when I color. I just, truth be told, I, I'm not good at coloring. But I think that's kind of like this story that we were reading. You don't have to color inside the lines. You don't have to be, uh, you know, a, a powerful soldier. You could be a, a, a widow. You could be someone, a, a mom who's, who's, whose son died. You don't have to be a, a pastor or a policeman. You could, you could be a soldier, an, an evil soldier, but God will still love you. But God will still love you, and God still loves me, even if I color outside the lines. That God still looks at that picture and says, you know what, that's a pretty nice picture. Now, I wish I could see all of your pictures, and if we were in church, I, I would have you share your pictures with me. Um, but you can ask your grown-up to take a picture of it with their, with their phone and send it to me, and I'd love to see your pictures that you colored today. Because I think, it's, I think it's good for us to remember that no matter how good we are at coloring, no matter how good we are at school or at sports, no matter how, how good we are at clearing the table, that, that God still loves us and that God will still heal us no matter what. Let's pray and then um, I'm going to keep talking for a little bit and, and talk to the grown-ups. But you can keep coloring if you want. And again, ask your, ask your grown-ups to send me a picture, okay? Let's pray. Hey God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for showing us that, that you love us even if we're not good at coloring, that you love us even if, if we're not good guys, that even when we try, that you're happy with that. Lord, we're sorry when we do bad things. Help us to do good things. Help us to, to be nice people. But thank you for loving us even when we're bad and for giving us another try. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Have a good week, kids. I'll see you soon. When Jesus had finished saying all this to the people who were listening, he entered Capernaum. There, the centurion's servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly, This man deserves to have you do this, because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes. And that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the man, then the men who were sent returned to the house and found the servant well. Soon after, Jesus went to the town called Nainan, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. A large crowd from the town was with her. When Jesus saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, Don't cry. Then he went up and touched the bearer. They were carrying him on, and the bearers stood still. He said, Young man, I tell you, get up. And the dead man sat up and began to talk. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. They were all filled with awe and praised God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea 
and the surrounding country. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Friends, will you pray with me for a minute? Lord, may the words of my mouth and meditation of all of your hearts be pleasing in your sight. O Lord, our creator, our redeemer, and our sustainer. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. So last week we looked at Jesus teaching and explaining and expanding the Sabbath. He was talking with the Pharisees and, and expanding our definition, asking questions like, can you do good or can you do evil? Can you save a life or destroy a life? And then Jesus called out his 12 apostles. We fast forward a couple of, uh, a couple of weeks today. And, and what we missed over was, was Jesus's Sermon on the Plain. This is in Luke. So Matthew has the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus um, stands up on the side of a mountain and preaches. Um, the Sermon on the Plain is a different sermon. It, it borrows a lot of, of the same message. Um, the way that I always like to explain it is as a pastor, I preach 45 to 50 sermons a year, depending on, depending on vacation and um, whether or not there's a pandemic going on. Um, so I, I preach 40 to 50 new sermons um, really every, every year. It, every week is a brand new sermon. Um, when, when the bishop preaches or when the DS preaches or when an evangelist preaches or when, when you make the big bucks and, and you travel and preach, you only need to preach like like maybe five sermons. Um, I you know it, w when you get to the higher levels, you really only need five good sermons uh, because most of the time people aren't going to see you um, until you know a couple months later. Uh, pastors don't get away with that. Um, so what I think I think the Sermon on the Plain borrows a lot from the Sermon on the Mount in part that I think Jesus was Jesus wanted to make sure that the core message from the Sermon on the Mount would be remembered. But the Sermon on the Plain changes a little bit. In the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew, we have the, the Beatitudes. Uh, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed those who are hungry. Blessed those who are meek. Um, for, the, for theirs is the kingdom of God. In Luke, we have the Beatitudes, and then we have the woes. So Jesus says, blessed are you who are hungry. Blessed are you who are thirsty. Blessed are you who are tired. And then he says, woe to you who are rich. Woe to you who are powerful and, and oppressive. Woe to you who are, who are well fed and ignore the, the poor among you. And it's interesting, this change, because I think it, again, speaks to what Luke is trying to do and what Luke is trying to tell us about Jesus. And then when we look at these two stories, again, I, I want us to keep, keep some of this in the back of our minds. We have two stories that usually are preached and, and taught separately. Uh, but in the in the big plan that we are doing, we're doing everything quick um, because we are walking with Jesus toward Jerusalem. And and just like Jesus, he knows where he is going and knows that he's going to the cross. And so as we're walking with him, we're following him. But sometimes we're 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 reading a whole bunch um, and a lot of stories at once. Jesus entered Capernaum, it says in, in Luke chapter seven. Then there was a centurion servant who came up to him. A, a centurion is a, a Roman soldier. Um, a, a centurion was was a, an officer uh, in charge of uh, anywhere from from fifty to eighty to a hundred legionnaires. Um, uh, you know the, the the typical Roman foot soldier. Um, this was this was like a colonel, um, may, maybe a major. Uh, you know the 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 centurions were were they, they were officers. They were the ones you know they were. They were the guys who, who knew what they were doing. And so a centurion servant, the, the servant of a Roman officer, um, comes and says that the servant, the slave of the Roman officer, was about to die. And Luke tells us that the, that the centurion, the Roman officer, heard of Jesus and sent some of the, some of the elders, um, sent some of the, 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 the important Jews in the community, sent them to say, you know, this is a, a Roman soldier, this is a Roman officer, but, but he loves Israel. He's a Gentile. He's Roman. He's not Jewish. But, but he helped build a, our synagogue. He helped us and, and isn't, isn't necessarily evil like we would assume the Roman soldiers are. And so in verse 6, it says Jesus went with them. He went with the servant to go and, and 
and find the centurion and, and I, I assume to help. And then when Jesus gets closer to the home, it says in verse 6, continuing, uh, the centurion sent some friends and said, Lord, don't trouble yourself. I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. Uh, The centurion was a Gentile. Um, Jesus would have been unclean had he gone into a Gentile's home. So the centurion says in verse 7, that is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word and my servant will be healed. Don't even come in and lay hands. Say the word, and my servant will be healed. And then the centurion says something very fascinating. I myself am a man under authority. Just like you, Jesus, I am a man under authority. Soldiers are under me. I tell one go, and he goes. And that one come, and he comes. And I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. The centurion is saying, Jesus, you and I are on the same level, not militaristically. This isn't, you know, two opposing generals uh, looking at each other's rank and, and you know, understanding a, a soldier's camaraderie. The, the centurion is saying, Jesus, I understand that you have authority. I understand that you are the Messiah and the Son of God. If you just say the word, my servant will be healed. And so Jesus turns to the crowd and says, such faith is in this centurion, such faith in this Gentile, in this Roman soldier, in this Roman officer. I haven't found this faith anywhere else in the countryside. And so those went home and found the servant had been healed. And then in the same breath, again, um, the scroll of Luke wasn't broken up into verses and chapters and headings. Um, Immediately after this story, we see the next story. When Jesus enters a town called Nain, the disciples and a crowd went with them. They come to the town gate and there's a funeral procession, a a widow. Um, So a woman who has lost her husband is grieving the loss of her son. She has lost everything at this point. Um, In verse 15, it says the dead man. So so, uh, an older son, probably probably a a young adult taking care of of his widowed mother. And in verse 13, it says, when the Lord saw her, his heart, went out, his heart went out to her, and he said, don't cry. So then he went up and he touched the, the, um, like the casket, and the bearers, the pallbearers stood still. He, Jesus said, young man, I say to you, get up. And the dead man got up and started to talk, and went to his mother. These two stories are related, friends. The centurion, we see a man of faith. A man of such devout faith as a Gentile. A man of such devout faith that that he doesn't even need Jesus to come into his home. He doesn't even need Jesus to, to lay a hand. He knows that if Jesus just says the word, just like his own word, that it will be done. And then with the widow, this isn't a story of faith. This is a story of compassion. Jesus' heart went out to her. I've, I've presided over many funerals, and I'll be the first to admit, it is probably the hardest thing as a, as a pastor to do, to, to sit with a grieving family um, and to try to, to, try to show a, a, a sense of compassion. My, my heart, without fail, breaks every single time. I feel like the, the friends of, of Job's, in the beginning of Job, not, not the second half of Job, but in the beginning of Job, where it says his friends come and they sit with him in the street and they stay silent for seven days and seven nights. And Job's friends don't get Job into trouble until they open their mouths, but that's that's a different sermon for a different day. Jesus' heart went out to her. Our hearts break with empathy when we surround those who are mourning. Our, our hearts break with 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 sympathy when we are with someone who is ill or lonely, when we are with those who are hungry or tired or broken. Our our hearts go out just like Jesus' heart goes out to this widow. 
last week we talked about the Sabbath and that Jesus was rooted inside of his Judaism. He wasn't replacing Judaism. He wasn't starting something brand new. He was he was expanding it, improving it. He was saying that there's more than just the law. I am the Lord of the Sabbath. There's more than just the law. You can do good on the Sabbath. And I think this week, I, I think what we see in these two in, in these two stories is a fascinating, fascinating insight into who God is. That our faith can heal us. I also know many faithful people who have not been healed by their faith. And, and the question that always breaks my heart is, is why not? Did I not pray hard enough? Did I not believe hard enough? Did I not fight hard enough? And the compassion of God, when, when the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, don't cry. Friends, we talk a lot, and especially in Bible study, I keep bringing this up, that the Bible fascinates me. And, and every time I turn the page, I find some new, new life, new, new drink of, of, of water, a, a new sense of awe in who God is. When, when God, when, when Jesus chooses his, his apostles, and chooses Peter, who denies him, and, and chooses the sons of Zebedee, who uh, the sons of thunder, the J James and John, who come up and, and demand a place next to Jesus in his kingdom. When Jesus chooses Judas Iscariot, who would betray him? That Jesus can choose these men as his closest and best friends, that I know that he will choose me to serve as a minister, to, to serve in a in a in a place of, of ministry and authority, even though I am a sinner, that I know that his grace and forgiveness extends far beyond what I can appreciate and what I can understand. That our faith can can heal us, but that our can that God's compassion can also heal us. That God's heart goes out and goes with us and breaks with us and and Jesus sits and mourns with us that that it is not just for the devout. It is not just for the Methodist or the Catholic or the Lutheran or the Baptist or the non-denominational. It is not just for those who have been baptized in the Spirit. God's heart goes out to each and every human being. That Jesus knows compassion and empathy and knows what it means to lose a son and what it means to lose a mother, even if he never actually did, that, that Jesus lives in our pain and frustration and gives us a chance to be born again. Gives us a chance to be, to be renewed in life. And, and even if we die and are not resurrected, that we know we will be resurrected one day soon. That God's compassion goes further out than you and I could ever imagine, that, that God's grace and peace is far bigger than we can believe, that, that God is with us even in the very low hours of the night at two or three or four in the morning when you are laying in bed and you don't know what is happening in your panic attacks and your illnesses and your death and loss and mourning, God is still with you. And his heart goes out to you. And he knows you and he loves you. And all he wants to do is, is make it better. And the problem, the difficult part is that it doesn't always get better. And so sometimes we mourn. Sometimes we mourn and are comforted. Sometimes we mourn and we are not comforted. But that doesn't mean God is apathetic. That doesn't mean that God doesn't care or has walked away from the table. It means that, that God is still compassionate and his heart still goes out to you. And that for whatever reason, for whatever reason, the worst has happened. Friends, we are getting ready for Lent. We are entering into the season in, in about a week and a half. We're going to enter into the season of, a, of penitence, of, of repentance, of turning away from our sins and turning away from the ways in which we, we distance ourselves from God and to try to find a way in this season 
to, to come closer to God to find God, to, to die to our former selves and be born again in the light and love of the, of the God who created us. And I know that this year is not normal and that our Ash Wednesday service won't be normal and that our Easter service won't be normal and that, and that for many of us, we are still mourning. Mourning the loss of loved ones or mourning the loss of of a lifestyle or mourning the loss of, of normalcy. But that God is still there. God is still compassionate. God is still there with us in our mourning. God is still there with us in our anxiety and in our depression and in our doubt. God is with us and is walking alongside of us and, and trying to show us that, that maybe this won't last forever. Or maybe God has something better in stock, or maybe things are about to change and that we just have to keep holding on and keep having faith like the centurion. Or that God just has compassion and love for us, like for the widow. So as we are preparing for Lent, as we are getting ready for Lent as we have a week and a half until, until Ash Wednesday, until the official start of Lent and this time of repentance and mourning, this time of, of inward looking and, and trying to figure out what our sins are and how we can live better lives and how we can look out and see how, how society has created sin and how society has been sinful. Friends, I hope that you join me in, in taking some time, taking some time this, this next week, taking some time over the next week and a half or throughout this Lenten journey to, to stop for a moment. To stop for a moment and, and praise God for his compassion. Praise God for, for the gift of faith that, that, that God has given us, but also to, to recognize the ways in which we have sinned. The ways in which we have sinned against God, the ways in which we have sinned against one another, the ways in which we have sinned and continue to sin, and the ways in which we need to put our sin on the shelf. We need to turn our backs to sin. We need to turn away and to face toward God. To be as faithful as the centurion and know that with one word, God can heal us. To have faith like the widow and maybe not faith, but, but to mourn like the widow and know that God has compassion on us. That God lives with us, that God sits inside of our doubt and anxiety and mourning and that God's heart goes out to us. And so friends, let us repent of our sins. Let us turn our backs on our sins and instead tor tor uh, turn to God who will forgive us, who will show compassion to us, who will heal us and raise us from the dead at, at the final days. The United Methodist Church has a uh, prayer of confession. It's going to come up on your screen. A prayer of confession that I would like us to pray together. We don't pray in, we don't pray, um, we don't confess our sins in a confessional booth. We don't confess our sins before, um, the, father, before the priest who, who gives us our penance. We confess our sins before God and before one another. We confess our sins publicly because we know that forgiveness and, and pardon has already been given to us by the cross. And so, friends, as we pray this prayer of confession and as I will share these words of pardon afterwards, I hope that you don't just pray this prayer um, rote. I, I hope that this isn't just a prayer that you say because it shows up on your screen and then um, we, we leave here unchanged. I, I know that I'm guilty of that sometimes. That uh, I know it's happened a couple of times where I've said the Lord's Prayer and have messed up because it's so it's so almost rote. It's, it's memorized that I sometimes mess up. <laughs> Friends, I hope that we can take this opportunity to pray this prayer, to confess our sins and to mean it, to turn toward God and not away from God, to repent of our sins, whatever they are and whatever you are dealing with, to repent of our sins and know that forgiveness is on the other side, to know that God has already forgiven us and already loved us and already saved us and is already working to make us better. 
Let us pray. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Friends, a couple of quick announcements, and then uh, we'll go out in song. Today we're having Coffee Fellowship at 11 a.m. It's right after worship. Um, we're also having communion. So uh, bring a, a piece of bread or a cracker, bring um, some juice or water or milk. Uh, we're going to have communion and then continue on in our worship service, or in, in our fellowship time, excuse me. Um, you can leave right after communion, but all are invited um, and, and boy, do I hope that we can share communion together in person soon. I am, I am prayerful and hopeful and um, cannot wait for that day. There's no confirmation tonight. Um, enjoy the Super Bowl and uh, whichever team you're, you're uh, rooting for, enjoy the Super Bowl and time with your family. Uh, this Wednesday at 7.30 p.m. online, we're having Bible study. All are invited. The Bible study is not, it's not a book study. It's not a a weekly um, study that you have to attend. Uh, it really is a study based on the sermon and based on the scripture. Maybe a better uh, example would be uh, a sermon study, although I don't like that phrase at all. Uh, we, we focus on the Bible, um, but we're focusing on the scripture that I read today, um, or the scripture that Bob read today and that I preached on today. Um, and so really it's going to be a, a bit of a conversation about what we just talked about, um, 
some some questions that are going to be emailed out to you on Tuesday, um, and then just any other questions that we have about the text. Um, all are invited. It's about an hour, 7.30, uh, Wednesday evening. Again, all are invited, and, and we'd love to see you there. Uh, finally, we have a new online giving platform. You can find the information out at marltonumc.com slash give. Um, your tithes and offerings are, are, are so blessed. And, and I, I know I keep saying this, and it's truly because of how amazed I am by this, that in the midst of this pandemic, the church has stepped up. And we have continued, um, and you have continued to remain faithful in all of your tithes and offerings and and on behalf of everyone here in ministry at, at Marlton United Methodist Church, thank you. Um, we are in a great place and, and able to to take steps in ministry that uh, we are excited about and, and hope that you are excited about too. Um, if you haven't uh, been faithful in your tithes and offerings, that's okay. It's never too or never too late to to start up again if you can. If you're unable to, we totally understand um, whether it's whether it's been affection, affection, whether you've been affected by COVID, um, by the financial situation, by anything else that's going on, we understand. Uh, we would love to connect with you if you need anything. If, if we can help, if we can connect with you, if there's anything that you need, please let us know. Um, there's a lot of people that are willing to help and, and willing to, to find ways to continue to connect and continue to serve one another. Um, and if you would like to serve, again, uh, please let us know that as well. We'd love to connect with you and continue to connect. Uh, friends, our, our closing hymn is You Came, uh, but hear this ancient Celtic uh, benediction. May there be always be work for your hands to do. May your purse always have a coin or two. May the sun always shine upon your window pane. May a rainbow be certain to follow each rain. May the hand of a friend always be near to you. May God fill your heart with gladness to cheer you. Friends, go out in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'll see you soon. Have a good week. Bye.
see your face I am alive You came I knew that you would come You came I knew that you would come You say My heart it woke go I'm not afraid I see your face You came, I knew that you would come. You turn my fear into faith. Thank you.